Hi everyone, welcome back to my true crime channel. Thank you guys so much for watching. Today's video is really, really bizarre. It's actually a case that I only heard of very, very recently and I don't know how it didn't get more sort of media attention and how more people haven't heard about it. In today's video, we are going to be exploring how 43 Mexican students vanished off the face of the earth. As with most of my videos, this video does contain distressing themes, so please do click off if that's not for you. Also, just a disclaimer that all of the information in this video, I have found myself through research on various sources on the internet, um, so I've done my best to obviously make it as factual as possible. On the 26th of September 2014, 43 Mexican students disappeared from a teacher's college after being forcibly abducted in Mexico. So just a little bit of context behind the college and who these students actually were. The teacher's college was a left-wing all-male school closely involved with student activism. So this is going to play quite a key part in this story. The students would regularly participate in protests. That was quite something that they did quite regularly. And the day that they vanished, 100 students had traveled to Iguala, which was a nearby town. So they were intending to hijack some buses to protest in Mexico City. Um, and apparently this was quite common because when I first looked into this case, I was thinking that is really not like a regular thing that you would do is just hijack a bus. But apparently this was quite commonplace. So one member of the group said that they were planning on just convincing um, the drivers to take the group and not like forcing them um, to drive them but I don't know how accurate that is. The trainee teachers were wanting to protest against what they saw as unfair discriminatory hiring practices for teachers so apparently a new law was coming in and this was going to mean that the teachers would have to take some standardized tests. They also were intending to raise money for a trip to Mexico City to mark the anniversary eerily of the 1968 massacre when a large number of students were killed by security forces in the capital. So I feel like this was really kind of foreshadowing the horrible, horrible events that were about to take place. So on the 26th of September, like I said, at around 6 p.m., 100 students headed to Iguala, the small town, and reports state that they commented some of the buses and at 9 p.m. they tried to drive out of the city so so far everything was kind of going to plan for them and they're just trying to drive out of the city now however at this point they were confronted by police it's reported that the police at this point blocked off the road and prevented them from driving away um, some students managed to escape the bus but reports state that police opened fire onto the buses and accounts of what happened do vary quite a lot um, but surviving students claimed that some tried to fight back by throwing rocks at the police like in self-defense um, the officers maintain that they opened fire on the bus is because the buses had been hijacked while obviously the surviving students are kind of saying the opposite and they're saying that the drivers had agreed to give them a lift so there was no need to um, you know come in all guns blazing being so violent police also in this kind of like frenzy that's going on they also mistakenly fired at a bus that was carrying a local football team and they actually killed the driver of the bus as well as one of the football players and also a stray bullet sort of flung off and hit somebody hit a woman in a taxi and she also died so it just sounds like it was absolute carnage to be honest so three students on the buses were also killed two of them were shot dead and this bit is really quite gruesome the body um, of a third student was found mutilated the next day um, the next morning near to the scene and this was the body of Julio Caesar Mondragon Mondragon, hope I'm saying that right, um, and he appeared to have been violently tortured. How the police can say that they were firing because the buses had been hijacked and they were maybe trying to protect the driver, I just think is absolutely crazy. You don't then go and torture a student and leave, leave him for dead. So 43 of the students were reported missing after this clash with police. 
um, and eyewitnesses reported seeing a massive amount of students being piled into police vehicles and taken off, being driven off somewhere. In total, 43 students completely vanished and no one would hear from them again. Um, it really is a heartbreaking case. I just feel so much for the families of these students. You know, quite a lot of them were so young, like 19 years old. So I'm moving on now to the investigation into this because obviously there was an uproar. Obviously the family, families of these um, students are wondering where the hell they've gone. Um, there's not really answers for the family. They don't have any clarity on what's gone on here. So the investigation carried out in the following weeks found that they were taken to a police station in the nearby town of Kukula. They were then handed over by corrupt police officers to members of a local drug gang called, in English, the United Warriors. So this is what the original investigation stated. Um, and it was believed that the gang then took them to a local rubbish dump where they killed the students and burned their bodies. And the report stated that the gang dumped the remains of the trainee teachers in a nearby stream. Now I did obviously just state that that was the original report because this has since been widely discredited. Now we're gonna talk about some other theories and things that may have happened. Um, in just a second. But in terms of the 43 students, some of their remains have actually been found, um, which is really, really heartbreaking for the families. Now, charred bone fragments were found in 2014, and these were a match to 19-year-old Alexander Mora. However, the location where these remains were found is disputed. There's a little bit of confusion about where they were actually found. It was originally stated that the remains were found at the rubbish dump, but an independent group stated the chain of evidence had been broken and it could not be sure that Mora's bone fragments came from the dump. So has someone meddled with evidence here? Have they maybe placed the fragments there. Now this is really interesting. A drone footage was revealed that shows Marines tampering with the rubbish dump, which casts obviously serious doubts over the evidence that has been found. Why were they tampering with the rubbish dump? Um, the Marines visit to the dump was also not officially recorded. So it seems pretty suspicious here that the only reason that we know that they were there was because there was drone footage. Remains of a foot bone were also found in 2019 in a ravine about 800 meters from the dump. And they were a match to 19 year old Christian Alfonso Rodriguez. More human remains were also found at the same ravine in 2021. And these were matched to another 20 year old student. Now, the discredited government report, obviously, that we talked about just a second ago, did originally state that the bodies were burned at the rubbish dump, um, but this was dismissed in 2016 by Argentine forensic experts. And obviously, if they're forensic experts, they probably, um, that probably holds quite a lot of weight to what they're saying. They stated that there was no biological or physical evidence to indicate that a fire had even taken place. There was quite a lot of talk that the area where the um, remains were found and where it is believed that, that a fire had taken place, A, it would have been very, very visible if a fire had taken place there and nobody claimed that they'd seen the fire in action. And B, the fact that there would have been a forest fire as a result of any kind of fire in that area, which there wasn't. So it is kind of suspicious. So what actually happened to the students then? Because obviously it's still we still don't really know. Now, lots of their relatives suspect they were taken to local army barracks. Um, and at first, when I saw this theory, I was kind of thinking, I don't really see the logic here. But actually, several family members demanded access to the barracks following the disappearance of the boys, but they were denied entry. So it kind of makes you think, what are they covering up here? The government also refused to let the soldiers be questioned by anyone, which also obviously raises suspicions of some sort of cover-up. What are they afraid of them saying? Now, another theory which I do feel holds quite a lot of weight is, when you look into it, it is kind of suspicious. Um, this theory involves the mayor's wife, who was scheduled to make a speech on the day of the attacks she was trying to gain support in succeeding her husband as mayor. Now, some reports discuss the potential of the students to have maybe bombarded the conference. It, it could have been that something that they were planning on doing. So it is possible that they were 
potentially trying to get rid of the students. Um, now, due to this controversy and the link between the missing boys and the mayor and his wife, many were calling for him to resign. And although he wouldn't, on the 30th of September, he asked for 30 days leave, um, a leave of absence. So federal agents went to his house to obviously take a look at what was going on here and the mayor had actually fled. They raided his home and found that he'd left with his wife and children. Um, and his wife was also, this is really key, his wife was found to be the sister of a cartel gang member. So it feels like it's very, very intertwined. We don't really know who we can trust. The police, the mayor, the cartel, it all seems to be kind of linked. Now, was this couple the mastermind behind these attacks and the kidnappings, or were they just used as scapegoats potentially by other gangs or, or um, police? Now, in November, the mayor and his wife were arrested and the mayor was sent to prison for pending homicide charges, organized crime and forced disappearance. Again, we don't know whether this is because there's particular evidence to suggest that they were involved or they could just be used as scapegoats. On October the 18th, the gang leader of the United Warriors gang, which I mentioned before, was arrested. A theory that, again, is quite valid, I believe, is that the United Warriors gang may have mistakenly thought that the group of students were a rival gang. It could have been maybe a motive for their kidnapping. It could also have been that the bus that the students um, had hijacked or commandeered could have been involved in substance dealing, substance trafficking. There is um, a lot of substance use, a lot of drug dealing going on in that local area. So it isn't too far fetched to think that potentially the vehicle could have been involved in some sort of transportation and they've just hijacked the wrong vehicle. It's like a case of wrong place, wrong time. I think personally this is quite feasible. Um, some gang members were arrested and actually admitted to having shot the students and burned their remains. Now, are they admitting this because it's the truth or are they admitting this for maybe a reduced sentence? Are they just trying to pretend like they're cooperating? Are they covering up for something else? It's really, really difficult to tell. In 2020, more police and soldiers were arrested and the man who was actually in charge of the original investigation that I mentioned had been discredited, Jesus Karam, has actually been arrested. He will go on trial charged with forced disappearance, torture and the obstruction of justice. But the last bits in the media that I could really find um, were from August last year and there doesn't really seem to have been much of an update. I can't see whether he's actually gone on trial yet. I feel like that might shed some light on potentially some evidence that they've got here. An arrest warrant has also been issued for the head of the investigation, Thomas Zeron, who fled to Mexico and is thought to be in Israel. So this case to me just feels very chaotic. There's loads of different people that could potentially be to blame, loads of people that could potentially be linked in the government, in the police, in the gangs, the mayor and his wife. There just seems to be a lot of like dodgy dealings and stuff going on here. Now the sad thing is the majority of the missing students have still not been found. Obviously I mentioned some remains have been found which has obviously led a lot of people to presume that all 43 students have died. Um, I think it's really, really sad that there is no sort of conclusive resolution to this for the families. I can't imagine how awful that is, just being in that limbo, not actually knowing, not being able to give your family member a proper burial. Like, that's, I feel, the, the least that they deserve out of this. It seems like everybody's blaming everybody and, everybody's just randomly being arrested and held and there's not really one particular person who has taken full responsibility for this so who knows if we will find out some more information hopefully things will come out in the sort of coming months and years and hopefully we can get some sort of um, justice for these these boys i don't think anybody deserves to be kidnapped um, and killed. I'm really, really interested in your opinions on this case. Please do leave a comment below. If you've got any other theories, if you've heard any updates on this case, I'd be really interested to know. Thank you so much for watching and hopefully I'll see you all on my next video.